I'm going to ask if you would to turn in your Bible with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. We've now entered, as Deborah told you this morning, the season of Advent. And Advent comes from the Latin word coming. When Christians celebrate the Advent, we're celebrating the coming of Christ. And this season of Advent, this season of Advent, um, represents several things. It represents when Christ the first, came the first time in the flesh in Bethlehem. It also, Advent means when Christ comes to our hearts daily, and also when Christ will come in His glory at the end of the age. And this season offers the opportunity to share in this longing for the coming of the Messiah, and also for the to be on alert for the coming at the end of the age. Now let us read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning, God, that you've given us life and breath and an opportunity to be here in this place at this time listening to your message. So, Father, I pray that you prepare our hearts, God, and that, Jesus, you will change our hearts and our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. What is it that you really hope for? I mean, of course, we could all give this religious answer. Uh, well, we all hope that, you know, God's will will be done. But in reality, there's a lot of things that we hope for, isn't it? I mean, we hope for maybe wealth or we hope for popularity. We hope for prosperity. We hope for good health. There's a lot of things that we hope for. But what I've discovered is the earthly things that I hope for always seem to fail. They always seem to let me down. You know, I, I, you see it happen over and over again. Even those that are the most popular or the most uh, wealthy still don't seem satisfied, do they? They seem to have a longing for something else. There's something about us that when we finally think that we arrive, it's just quite, it's never quite enough, is it? Boy, if I could only have that new car, you get it, and this is dirty as the old car in about three weeks, you know? If I could only have that new house, if I could only have that new wife, that new husband, whatever it may be, you know, we're never satisfied. There's something in us that's never satisfied once we think that we get what we hope for. But in order for us to talk about what hope really is, we have to first of all talk a little bit about hopelessness. Because the hope, the spiritual hope that I'm talking about this morning is not just hope for wealth or popularity or fame or prosperity. It's a hope of an eternal life, a, a Zoe life that comes within us that satisfies us at the core of our being. And that is what we hope for. That is what, what we will eventually get to because God is going to, to allow in our life hopelessness. He does. I'm, if you live long enough, there's going to come a day that in a certain area of your life, you're going to feel this. You're going to feel this despair. You're going to feel this hopelessness. Things are going to happen. You see, because most of our lives, we try to get things under our control. We, we try to manipulate people to do our will. We try to manipulate life and circumstances to go our way. And then there comes that time along the way that we realize that this doesn't really satisfy and that really there are things that are beyond our control that we cannot change. We cannot change certain people or circumstances or situations and when we finally come to that point of realizing that no matter what I do, he's not going to love me. No matter what I do, she's not going to love me. No matter what I do, I'm not going to quit drinking. No matter what I'm going to do, I can't stop using these drugs. No matter what I try to do, I cannot overcome the death of my mother or my father or my husband or my wife or my kid. I can't do it. And, and it's like a black cloud that begins to hang over us of hopelessness. And when that hopelessness comes upon us, if we stay in that very long, what it does is it begins to erode our spirit. It begins to erode our faith. And we begin to think that nothing really matters. Kind of like that Queen song, right? Nothing really matters to me. 
You know, and, and that's a sense of hopelessness you get. Some of you have been there. Some of you have been there. I mean, you tried your best to, to, to keep hope alive. You, you tried to work on that marriage. You tried to work on that situation. You tried to uh, stop doing some of the things you were doing or start doing some other thing. And just somewhere along the way, you said, I can't do this. It's beyond my control. I give up. I quit. Some of you have been there. And some of you are there right now. Some of you feel exactly what I'm talking about, if you were to be truly honest with yourself. And it begins to work, like I said, it begins to corrode and erode the very faith that can God really do this? Can he really do this? You see, hopelessness, when you get there, you may not believe this, but you're actually at a crossroad. God will allow you to get there because God loves you. He will allow you to get there because he wants to teach you several lessons. And one of the lessons that he wants to teach you is that your life basically has never been in control. You just thought it was. You thought you had it all together, but you really didn't. And you thought that if you got these things or you manipulated these things or if you got that woman or if you got that man, then you would be happy. And you only discovered that you were happy for a moment and it simply passed and now you're not. Because nothing in this earth quenches the real deep thirst and hunger of your spirit except God. You can keep on trying, brothers and sisters. You can keep on trying to, to satisfy your soul, but it's never going to be satisfied until we find God. Until we truly find him. Now, I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about coming to church, just coming to church and singing a few praise songs and listening to the preacher. I'm talking about truly finding God in your own life. Truly finding hope that can only come through Christ. And the only way to get there, like I said, is to understand that without him, there is no real hope. I have found that those who are the truly, now this is just me. But I have found those that I love to hang around with the most that seem to be the most spiritual are people who went through the most trial and tribulation in their lives. Those, those who, have, who have really despaired, those who have really experienced hopeless, hopelessness, it's sort of like that woman that, that came to Jesus when he was in the Pharisees, this religious man's home, and he was eating dinner. And all of a sudden, this prostitute walks in, and she sees him over there, and she walks across the floor, uh, uh, facing all the scorn and the ridicule, because everybody in there knew how she lived her life. And she walks over there, and she begins to kneel at the feet of Jesus, and she begins to weep, and she bends over, and she wipes his feet with her hair and then he anoints his feet with oil and Simon this church going re religious Pharisee he's looking at Jesus and going well if he was really a prophet he would know what kind of woman is his touching him but Jesus reads his thoughts and Jesus says to Simon says Simon look at this woman Simon I'm looking at her I see exactly what she's doing Jesus says you don't understand Simon he who is forgiven much, loveth much. He who is forgiven little, loveth little. And that's so true. And so I find that people who really understand their need for God. You see, if you haven't been through stuff, you may play around with religious stuff and play around with God a little bit. But those who have really been through crisis and God has delivered, those who have really had a Messiah named Jesus, boy, those guys have a deep abiding faith because they know the God of the future was the God of the past. And in the past, God saved them. Now, there are some of you in here this morning, you think you kind of know what I'm talking about, but you really don't. Because you've never really given it to God yet because you're still in despair, you're still in hopelessness. You are. Because you've never really given it to God. I don't care if you've been going to church all your life. I don't care if you've listened to a thousand sermons and you are a deacon at the church or an elder or a preacher or in the praise man. That don't matter. 
You can surround yourselves with all the things that Jesus like Judas did and never recognize who he was and who he is. You can. You can get wrapped up in following Jesus like Judas the Zealot, thinking he's going to give me all the heavenly kingdom. He's going to set up his earthly kingdom on earth and I'm going to be right there beside him and get all the money. I'll be the treasurer. I'll be the secretary of state when he sets up his kingdom. And then all of a sudden, Jesus disappoints him in that way, and he goes through this hopelessness, and he betrays Christ. It's exactly what really happened. Jesus wasn't the Messiah. He expected him to be. So he betrayed him. And many of us here in our own little way do the same thing because we do not believe that God, that Jesus, is really the Messiah. Because we're taking it in our own hands, doing it our own way, working it out at home, trying to manipulate everything, feeling sorry for ourselves, be beating ourselves up. And we, we don't have that hope that only Christ can bring. You know, when, when we think of the word hope, we think of it as, as uncertainty. For example, we may say, you know, I hope to get off work early so I can see you before I leave, before you leave. In other words, you're saying, I, I desire to get off work early so that I can experience a good thing. Or we may use the word hope in a way that I'm kind of using it today. When I say, well, I really hope the Titans beat the um, New England Patriots. And I hope they do. That's my hope. I hope you're not a New England fan, but I hope they do. You know, our hope, we maybe want a, the best possible outcome to you know happen that we cannot control. So we'll say, well, I hope I don't get COVID-19. And so we, what we're saying is I'm hoping that the test is going to come back negative. And all of these hopes here are sort of like flipping a coin, aren't they? All these uses of hope is like flipping a coin. It's like, I, I hope I get off early, but I'm not sure that I will be able to see you before you leave. Or we're saying, I hope the Titans win, but whoop, I'm not going to put a whole lot of money on it. You know, I'm not going to really bet on it. And or I hope I don't have COVID-19, which really means, oh, please let the, let the results, test results come back negative. And so when we express hope, we're expressing uncertainty when we're using hope in that way. But the hope that, that the Bible is using in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, is not that kind of hope at all. The, Bible, the Bible's use of this word hope is a confident expectation. It is an expectation that it will be done it, because it's, it, the expectation that it will be done, this hope is because it's based in faith. And what is faith? Faith is not only believing that God can, but it's trusting that God will. And it's trusting that God has my best interest at heart, that God is always going to as it says in the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 28, all things work together for the good for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Now if somehow you take Romans 8 28 to mean that all things work together to make me happy, you are very badly mistaken because they're not. If you're going to sit there beside the deathbed of a dying mother or father, and you're going to sit there and go, this is going to end the way I want it to end because I know God, then you may be finding yourself disappointed. Or if you somehow think that all things work together for the good means that my husband who does not love me will eventually come to love me in the way that I want him to love me, you may be disappointed. You see, when, when God says that all things work together for the good, it goes on to say, for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose, for those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. So the good that God is trying to work out in our lives is and through every situation and every circumstances, he's trying to make us think and act and feel more like Jesus would think and act and feel. And so God is... God is going to allow bad things to happen to good people. He is. Now, there are some things that are atrocious to me. And I don't know how God didn't strike that person with lightning. I don't, I don't understand that. I don't understand how a child abuser got away with that. Or a pedophile. I don't, I, don't, I don't understand that. I mean, I don't. 
But I also don't understand how God let me get away with what I got away with without striking me down. Right? How did I get away with all this? It was only by his mercy and grace. You know, and, and even though the sin, the consequences of that sin, the repercussions of a sin that other people have done may be worse than mine, the fact is that it's all sin in the sight of God. And God, even to the pedophile, I hope you don't take this in the wrong way, but God, even to the pedophile, is hoping for repentance. He still loves him, but he hates the sin. He still loves me, but he hates the sin. And so God is going to allow bad things to happen to us, consequences to come upon us, and he says, that is working for my good. I don't understand that, Miss Faye. I don't understand that. I, I, I can't go to a funeral and preach a funeral and, and tell a, two parents of a child that they've lost that, that God's working this for the good. That's not the time for me to tell that. But maybe later on I can. If they can understand that even through it all, we don't see what God sees. And remember that scripture is only true when it says for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. It's for people who recognize that God is love and they love him and they trust him and they recognize that they, that they are called by him to a purpose. And that purpose is to, even in the midst of the storm, to trust God. Now, you may say, well, that's easy for God to say. <laughs> that's easy for Jesus to say. But was it easy for Jesus to say? Was it really? I mean, think about it for a moment. Wasn't Jesus in the Garden of, uh, garden of Gethsemane one day with his disciples, just to st the stones throw away? Wasn't it Jesus who got on his hands and knees and begged God to deliver him? Wasn't it Jesus who had with sweat drops of blood appearing on his head say, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but thine. He gave us the perfect example of someone going through adversity. His will, not God's will in that, in that moment. In that moment, he's tempted in the same ways that we are tempted. God, isn't there an easier way? Isn't there a better way? Do, do, you have to, do I have to go through this? And then he accepted by faith that God was going to allow his will to be done. And then Jesus had the hope that the Father would raise him from the dead. And it was with that hope that Jesus went to the cross. It was with that hope that he allowed Roman soldiers to beat him with a cat of nine tails, stripping the flesh off of his back. It was with that hope that he bore his cross up Calvary. It was with that hope that he lay his body down on that hot sand and allowed soldiers to drive nails through his feet and hands. It was with that hope that he was raised up exposed for the world to see. It was with that hope he looked out at a crowd that mocked and ridiculed him and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It's with that hope that somehow, some way, in the midst of this chaos, God's got this. That is hope. You see, hope is a future tense of faith. It is saying, God, I'm going to trust you. And because I trust you, I hope in you. And so when the Bible says hope, what it's saying is it is faith futurized. It is faith cast into the future. It is a certainty based upon the faith that does not imply uncertainty or lack of insurance. Instead, biblical hope is a quiet, confident expectation that God's will will be done and that in the end, when all is said and done, it will end in a such a way that we have been blessed. You know, hope dares to believe and trust even against the odds. Are you at the end of your rope today? Are you despairing? Do you feel hopeless? Good. Good. Because now you're at the crossroad. 
God brought you here. Quit blaming the devil. Devil can't do anything God doesn't allow. God allowed this to happen. He did. And you may be angry at God. That's okay. That's okay. Be angry at him. He, don't, he understands. And say, God, this is wrong. Isn't there a better way? That's okay, too. That's okay. But God brought you here. And God brought you here to teach you that the appetites of this world will never satisfy you. They won't. God brought you here to teach you that through the darkest hours of your life, God has got you. He's got you. You see, I do believe that God helps those who help themselves, but that's not in the scripture. See, that may be a principle that I like, especially with somebody who don't want to work <laughs> or someone who don't want to come to a meeting in recovery or someone who don't want to come to church. Well, God helps those who help themselves. You better get your back end up and get to a meeting. You better get your back end up and get to church. You better get your back end up and get in the scriptures. You better pray. You be I, I, I like that concept, but here is what I have found to be scriptural and what God says about those who cannot help themselves. When you come to a point that you cannot help yourself, God will help you. But you got to come to that point. That's why Jesus said over and over again, those who are well don't need a doctor. It's only those who are sick. And you see, we got to recognize we're sick before we go to a doctor. I, I don't like going for just a checkup. I feel like I'm throwing away my money. All right? It's when I'm sick, I go to the doctor. It's when I'm sick. And, and, and you know, most of us hate going, but we'll go if we're sick enough, won't we? And when you're sick enough, when you're sick and tired of the world, when you're sick and tired of your life the way it is, when you're sick and tired of, of your situations, your circumstances, and what's going on with you, you will get on your knees and you will ask God to take it. You will if you get sick enough. You will. Some of you are not sick enough yet. <laughs> you're not. <laughs> That's okay. You're going to stay in that hopelessness until you get that way. You will. You're going to stay right there. You might, you might have a good time tonight. But it'll be hopeless again tomorrow. You may have a good day today, but there'll be hopelessness again tomorrow until you get on your knees and invite the King of Kings and the Messiah into your life. Or as you enter the rope, you're in a great spot because God, somehow, some way, I think He put this in me because I'm very competitive. I don't even like to lose at Uno. You know, I hate I hate losing. People make fun of me all the time. You're so competitive. I know, I am, sorry. You know? But you know when I like, when my favorite times to win are? My favorite times to win is when I look like I'm going to lose. All of us like that. All of us love Rocky. If you don't like Rocky, something's wrong with you. We like Rocky getting beat up the whole match. <laughs> Apollo Creed. Bloody, battered, bruised, no way to win. Count him out. Doesn't hit the floor and the, the umpires over there, the referee, one, two. I mean, count him out every time. And somehow he grabs the rope and he struggles to his feet. I love Rocky. You like Rocky? And, and you know, every Rocky was the same. Rocky just didn't go out there. He was a heavyweight champion of the world, but he didn't just go out there and just knock people out. Instead, he was always down on the ground. Always down because... Whoever wrote Rocky, I think it was Sylvester Stallone, when he wrote Rocky, he knew there was something innate in people that love a great comeback. That's the way God is, Chris. He loves a great comeback. He loves it when the 10 count is at nine. When all is hopeless, he loves it. He's the fan of the underdog. He loves the clock to be one tick from zero. He loves to see his enemies cheer right before he hits the three-pointer that shuts their mouth. He loves happy endings, but he also loves the struggling, bloodied, bruised, seemingly defeated main character staggering to his feet and then making the knockout punch. God loves that. You see, his greatest 
He is the greatest. God himself is the greatest last second shot maker. He's the greatest, the unlikeliest of heroes, the game-ending grand slam, the walk-off home run, the Hail Mary. God loves it. He loves it. You see, today, your friends and enemies see a person struggling and stumbling in sin in their finances, failing in relationships, battling addictions, they see where you are, but they don't see where you're going. To see where you are right now, they see that, but they don't see what you are becoming. They see the slimy snail, but they don't know that you're one day going to be a beautiful butterfly. They see you as a shepherd boy. They don't realize one day you're going to be a king. They see you right now out there being defeated, but they don't know the rest of the story. Just like over 2,000 years ago, they laid Jesus in a borrowed tomb, and they sealed the tomb up, and Roman guards stood outside that tomb, and everyone said, it's over. That's it. It's over. Satan and his minions were laughing. We have defeated it. It's over. We rule the world. But what they didn't know is that the clock was counting down, going backward like in Carmen the Champion. And you see, what happened was, is though they thought it was over and Christ was defeated, they did not recognize that the stone would be rolled away. I love a sermon. Uh, I've actually heard this guy preach it. Google it. YouTube it. He's, um, he's an African-American preacher. And he preaches this sermon called Friday. It's Sunday. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And he talks about that on Friday, they crucified Christ. And on Friday, they beat him. And on Friday, they scourged him. And on Friday, they mocked him. And on Friday, they uh, ran a spear in his side. And on Friday, they took him down. And on Friday, they buried him in a borrowed tomb. But that was Friday. Sunday was coming. Because there it was no power in hell or on earth that could stop Jesus from rising from the dead. Now, I want a bit of that miracle in my life. I want a bit of that miracle in my life. And hope today is not an uncertainty. Hope is a conscious choice. It is choosing to place your faith in him and your hope in him. I like the old hymn. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. For over 2,000 years, Jesus was born into this world to give you hope. To give the world hope. To say that what's going on now will not always forever be. So no matter what you're going through, I want to give you some hope today. God knows your name. He knows your name. He knows what you're going through. He knows how you feel. And God just wants you to say, God, here it is. No matter what it is, I'm giving it to you. And our hope is found only in him. Would you stand with me? Father, we come before you today, God. Many of us in this room despairing. Many of us in this room hopeless. And God, we don't have to be. Because no matter whether we're in stage four cancer or whether we've got, Lord Jesus, a job situation that we'd like to change jobs, God, you care about every situation. That's why your word says in First Peter that we can cast all our cares upon you, for you care for us, all of our cares, all of them, no matter how big or how small, because you care for us. And so, God, I pray this morning, if there's anyone here without hope, that they would do the one thing that would give them hope, that they would trust their hearts and their lives to you. 
that they would give it to you this morning and let you take it. And that, God, they could relax in knowing that you love them and that you care for them. In Jesus' name, amen. The altar's open. I'll be glad to pray with you. If you'd like for me to, you can just come up here to me. If you'd like to join the church, we'd love to you become a part of our church here at Victory Baptists. Love for that. If today you've never given your heart and life to Christ ever, then today would be a good day to do that, to just surrender your will, your heart, your life over to Him. I'll lead you through a prayer that will show you how to begin that journey. Whatever God wants you to do, just be obedient today. Won't you come as Brother Chris plays?